and Christian faith uh, from the viewpoint of marriage. And I think I gave something like a heavenly marriage as a, uh, or a marriage in heaven as a topic for, for Celia uh, when, when she was asking for a title to share with you guys. And, and I hope we will do something something like that. Now you might remember already where where this kind of language comes from um, when we talk about heavenly marriage or or marriage in heaven. Oftentimes, I would imagine if you have read scripture, if you have read the book of Revelation, your thoughts would go to the Revelation chapter nineteen, where they speak about the marriage feast of the Lamb, uh, which now commences at the very end of the ages. But there's actually in, in scripture, there's much, much, much more uh, material where the relationship between uh, church uh, and, and God and Christ is, is described through the image of marriage or sometimes also engagement. Um, engagement and marriage sort of overlap here. Now, we will be looking at this topic through five, let's say, um, five little stops. First, we look at the marriage and a couple of Bible passages, uh, speaking of it, uh, and how that is, is used as an as a image uh, for, for Christian faith and life. We, we say a few things about the bridal mysticism, faith as a union between Christ and the believer. Uh, then we make a quick stop at the sanctification and make it, maybe wrap it up with a with few words of existentialism. But the lecture has been designed, hopefully so, that if we do run out of time, which is very possible that we do, um, it shall not be a huge loss. I think we are we are ready to, pretty much after the first half an hour, we are ready to um, call it call it a day whenever whenever we we need to, and we still have a comprehensive, understandable whole. Hopefully, all right. When we talk about marriage, um. As a picture of even greater things, um, we shall we can talk about marriage first of all when we when we read scripture and, and what they say about marriage. Of course, the obvious and the first thing is that marriage is a calling for a man and a woman, um, and this is this is not to be avoided. Obviously, this is this is the very basic primary way the scripture speaks about marriage. And any person who wishes to be married or is married should pay close attention to all those passages which speak about marriage as a God-ordained good institution, which also comes with its own callings and, and duties and responsibilities. But when it comes to marriage as, as we commonly have it between man and wife, we won't be looking at that too much today. And this is not to say that this is uh, less valuable. But it's it's not the topic for today. I think we shall have in, in in the history of Corpus Christi we have had, and we will have in the future also many times when we talk about marriage as it happens between human beings. Uh, but but for today the topic is different. Um, so we shall talk about marriage as a picture or an image of God and as an image of relationship between God and his church. And before we go into that, we have to maybe say a few words about generally images or, or examples or types, as it's also called. When we speak of images, we need to understand what is an image of what. Like if I make a scribbling on, on a paper, you know, of, of a dog, you could say that it is a picture of a dog, but especially with my skill of drawing, I think we could make a very clear distinction which is the real dog and which is only an image of the dog. And, and likewise, we, with, with these sort of scriptural images, we have to make clear what is the real thing or the, let's say the primary thing and what is then an image of that actual primary thing. And when, for example, we call God our father, does that mean God is like a father to us? We could answer that yes and no. In our own personal lives, we probably, uh, many of us came to know 
our earthly human fathers first. And when then somebody told me, uh, told us that God is our father, we reflected what we heard through what we already knew about all, our own father. So we sort of understood, okay, if God is father, then he must be something like my dad, or there is something similar at least there. And that is, of course, way, the way we humans learn these things. However, when we speak or step outside our own personal life history of learning or how we understand some concepts, the order is reversed. For example, when it comes to fatherhood of God, St. Paul actually states very clearly in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, uh, that God's fatherhood is the primary thing. And earthly relationships between fathers and children only reflect that first, foremost, most important primary relationship of God as our father. So it is also with marriage. When we say that marriage describes God or is an image of God, we should keep in mind that what we have in marriage here on earth is always, it's, you can say it's, it's similar to what the true heavenly thing is, it is uh, uh, signifying or describing. All right, so we shall go to the first chapters in, in scripture where we, where we already discover uh, creation of marriage. And uh, it's already in a very, very creation of, of, of the world and, and human life here. And I'll, I'll just put it here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, this is an important verse, oftentimes when we speak about human dignity or human value, because it shows that the man or, or humankind or humans uh, are an image of God. And that what that means is, again, a topic for another study. Um, again, we have to see here how the images go. Man is an image of God. So God is the primary thing, and a human being is an image of that God. It's not the other way around. God is not an image of man, even though you could say that sometimes theologians who are overly fascinated with psychology uh, and, and not so fascinated with, with scripture can go into that extreme saying that God is actually a reflection of man. Uh, God is an image of man rather than man being an image of God. Okay, but we don't think that way. The God is a primary uh, thing and man is an image of, of, of him. This being an image of God takes place especially in the fact that male and female, he created them. It is not just a coincidence that in the very same sentence or, or verse, God immediately, immediately brings forth the, the difference between man and woman and, and the difference and unity, one could say, that together, man and woman, together they are an image of God. Marriage is an image of God's own being, therefore. But how is it so? Now, one way we could look at it could be to see how in marriage, two perfectly independent, complete and true persons are joined together, fully, fully united with one another so that they become one. As Jesus says, they are no longer two, but they are one. Yet. Everybody who is married, and, and you know, even you, if you know any married people, we know that this oneness, what Christ says, they are no longer two, but they are one. Uh, even in this oneness, their individual personhood remains. Their souls and hearts and consciences, uh, their thoughts, their personalities are, you could say, united 
but not mixed with each other so that the man doesn't become the woman and the woman doesn't become the man or they don't get mushed into some sort of a monstrosity but but they are united with one another so that they are no longer two but they are one yet still they remain uh, individual persons now i don't know how how well this this media really gives us a chance to ask questions uh, gives chance for me to ask questions from you person uh, people there but uh, anyone want to make a guess of how does this then uh, work as an image of god That's right, Celia. Trinity. So, in the doctrine of Trinity, the Church confesses scripturally that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but he is one undivided nature or essence. So, we can say at the same time that God is one. He's not three, but he's one. And yet, uh, Father is not the same as the Son, and the Son is not the same as the Holy Ghost, and so on. That inside the Trinity there are distinct, real persons, yet they are united completely and utterly, so that there are no three gods, but there is only one. So, in this sense, you can say that the marriage is an image of God's own very being. That God, who is three persons, completely and truly, and yet undivided in essence, in marriage, the spouses are uh, individuals, uh, they retain their personhood, and yet they become one in their marriage. Uh, Christian understanding of marriage should therefore reflect our understanding of the Trinity. Again, it, the flow goes that way. We don't define Trinity based on marriage, but we should actually define our marriage based on Trinity. Where inside the Trinity of God, the persons of the triune Godhead, love one another. This is also how St. Paul deals with the often difficult topic of submission inside marriage. You might remember from Ephesians 5, where Paul uses the imagery of Father God and Son God, or God, God the Father and God the Son, and their relationship as an as a image of how the husband and wife should regard one another. Inside God's trinity, the Son submits to the Father, not because he is forced to do so, or because he would be by nature less worthy than the Father, but because the love between the persons uh, means this. This is how Father and Son love each other inside the trinity, is that the Father sends the son, and the son happily does what the father says. Uh, so, so inside the Trinity there is submission, which is completely in accordance with love uh, and dignity of these persons, if you, can, if you can even use such a word. Likewise, should submission in Christian marriage take place in a similar way, not through any kind of coercion or struggle for power, but following this pattern of God's trinity and the persons submitting joyfully and, and happily to each other. Now, as we understand, this is definitely a place where we see how all human images are distorted by sin, and therefore their ability to accurately describe or reflect their original purpose is hindered. We can only say, uh, you know, in a, in a very qualified sense these days, that marriage reflects God's internal being, because often human marriages are full of misunderstandings and, and hurt feelings and, and that kind of things. But this is more of a case where our marriages do not, uh, are not the kind of marriages they were meant to be, but rather show how sin is working in our lives. And this is a, maybe a little bit of an experimental thought. Um, don't quote me on this, but maybe you can you can just wonder about it together with me. Uh, it might be that, for example, in Islam, where there is no room for 
God's Trinity. Uh, also, the understanding of the relationship between man and woman is, is different. I wonder if that has something to do with it, that the Christian understanding of marriage is modified and, and transformed by Christian understanding of God's Trinity, where submission happens through love, uh, not through coercion. And there happens complete unity between independent beings. And, and, and this has produced in Christian culture and life certain kind of understanding of marriage, even with all the sin and everything. And maybe that is a one reason why we see that in, in some other, other religions, it doesn't produce it, that kind of uh, understanding of, of the relationship between genders, for example. And one could also then maybe say that it is collapse of Christian faith as we have experienced in Western countries, um, goes together with collapse of Christian marriage. That this, this one can't, uh, the marriage concept of Christianity cannot stand if the faith upon which it was founded is, is taken away. Okay, well, so that is one way the marriage reflects um, God's very internal being. But then there is also marriage as God's relationship towards his church. The church is throughout the scriptures described with feminine imagery. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul calls the relationship between the church and Christ as an engagement agreement where he, that is Paul, serves as the, uh, serves the bridegroom by guarding the bride against her enemies and any, any temptations that might be thrown at her. It is not a coincidence that marriage and wedding is probably the most used picture in all Christ's parables. He oftentimes, uh, our Lord tells parables of wedding feasts and marriages, and, and he even takes, um, takes uh, his very first, first sign, how a miracle is done in a, in a wedding feast in Cana. St. Paul reflects this in Ephesians 5, where he says in Ephesians 5.32, uh, concerning marriage, he states, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So human marriage, even in all its brokenness, still refers and points to something great, something greater, something more, even more substantial, um, that is the relationship between Christ and his church. And that will be now then the topic, topic for, the, for the remaining, what we have to say about, about this. Um, um, about this topic, we will now go into this, this relationship between God and church, and also God and an and individual believer. Uh, would anybody have any, any questions or comments at this point? I don't know if I can see you guys raising your hands. There's so many of you, but... Um, I don't see any hands up. Okay, let's go forward then. We have a topic called bridal mysticism. Bridal means something to do with bride or, or, or marriage or something like this. Now the image of marriage as a, as a, as a describing God and, and his saving work in the old church, old Christianity, was usually used on the level of collective or a group. That means the church as a group, the church as a whole, was compared to a bride, like, like Paul does in Ephesians 5, uh, which the groom, Christ, would then take as his wife. An uh, interesting shift then takes place uh, with a person called Bernard of Clairvaux, 
around high middle ages. And I'm not saying that this is a bad shift. This is just a kind of an interesting, interesting development. Uh, and, and Bernard of Clairvaux started to read the Song of Salomon, the, the what's that in other languages, the, the high song, the high, yeah, anyhow, that, that part, that book in the Old Testament, which talks about the love between man and wife, but quite a lot. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux started to read the Song of Salomon as an allegory of the relationship between an individual believer and Jesus Christ. And Bernard had this idea of bridal mysticism, which begins with a believer becoming humbled by the deceitfulness of this world, suffering hardships, and gradually the soul comes to realize that only in God true happiness can be found. Christ gradually becomes more pleasing and desirable to the soul, which then turns away from the petty pleasures of this world. At the same time, the soul adorns itself with good works, virtues, and piety, and, and makes with this kind of good works, uh, it makes itself pleasing and beautiful to Christ. So, so this is kind of an image of a, of a, of a human soul, uh, you know, say, kind of, kind of preparing for a big date night and putting on, putting on uh, makeup and new stockings. Uh, good works and, and, and praise for Christ. Now, Martin Luther, who, who generally speaking read quite a bit of Bernard of Claveau, um, he, he borrowed from Bernard's works, very probably, this very idea uh, for his own writing on the Christian liberty from 1520. And Luther's idea is there that he uses extensively uh, the imagery of marriage to describe the relationship between Christ and the believer. And Luther's, Luther's way of, of using this bridal imagery shares many similarities with Bernard, but uh, there is also some quite fundamental differences in how this relationship uh, is described. And I think those differences are very interesting and they reveals something quite profound about how Lutherans understand God's grace and, and, and in a, in a scriptural, scriptural sound manner, I, I would say. Um, one might say that Bernhard of Clairvaux seems to think in some kind of sense of spiritual courtship, whereas Luther's thinking resembles a spiritual marriage. In marriage, the groom or husband Christ is not primarily described through how desirable he is, handsome and beautiful, but rather through his trustworthiness, generosity and gentleness. The bride believer, uh, just like in Berner's idea, uh, goes through certain kind of becoming humbled, uh, whereas for Bernard, this kind of humility is just a way to enter into greater desire towards God. Luther understands that humility is already an end in itself. In true humility, the believer has come to understand that there is nothing he or she can offer to Christ that would impress him. Rather, she puts her trust completely in the passive sense, in the goodness and mercy of Christ. In, in Bernard's model, this sort of earlier bridal mysticism, the soul tries to make herself beautiful through good works and virtues. Whereas in Luther's bridal imagery, the soul brings into the marriage only debt, negative dowry of sin, death and guilt. And, and Luther's writing, actually, this difference he makes there was not lost to those who read Martin Luther. Uh, we have a writing from certain Jakob Hochstrassen, who I can copy it to the chat window. Um, 
he's very um, you know annoyed by by Luther's writing, and he says not a single word is said about the mutual love by which the soul loves Christ. No, no, nor do we hear anything about the other divine commandments to which the keeper of uh, of which eternal life is both promised and owed. What else do those who boast of such a base spectacle do than make the soul a prostitute and an adulteress? As if Christ does not take the trouble to choose a pure and honorable lover. So, so that's, I, I, I like the quote because it puts in such crass and clear words the, the offense the gospel gives, especially to certain kind of pious soul. Um, this, this Jakob Hochstrassen is offended on behalf of Christ because in, in Luther's writings it seems like, like, like Jesus is, is likened almost to a, a little bit of a dim-witted but rich guy who cannot see the, 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 that, that he's actually dating a very bad girl. And that he's going out with a, with a woman who really he shouldn't be going out with. And this is going to end up badly. I don't know if you, you've ever been in a situation where your good friend is, is, has been fallen, fallen in love with a person they really, really shouldn't be hanging out with. But it seems like this Hochstrasse guy has exactly this kind of scandal that in Luther's writing, it seems like he's making Christ uh, marry below him, as they say in Jane Austen novels, you know, marry below yourself. That's what happens when some lord or lady uh, falls in love with a peasant. And, and it really seems like this is happening uh, in Luther's writing that Jesus Christ is this high and honorable groom, and then he falls in love with this woman who is not as good as his bride ought to be. And this is very characteristic of, of Martin Luther's, many of his, his theological insights, that he writes in the context of, let's say, medieval tradition, but he then gives it a, a, a bit of a new twist. Uh, the marital imagery does not simply describe the love of Christ towards uh, uh, a girl or, or a lady who doesn't seem that uh, lovable, but it goes beyond that, bringing in the legal side of marital contract in the freedom of a Christian. Uh, Luther begins by speaking of Christ as the completely holy, undying righteous person who, by the wedding ring of faith, takes a share in the sins, death and hell of his wife, makes them his own, and deals with them no otherwise than as if they were his. I'll put that also in the chat window. So Christ truly commits himself to the believer and takes upon himself her sins, suffers the punishment for them, defeats the enemies of death and the devil, and attains righteousness in the eyes of God and life in his resurrection. The believer in, in turn receives from Christ blessedness and grace, which truly becomes hers. Just like a wife truly becomes a co-owner of the property of her husband. Thus the believing soul by the pledge of its faith in Christ becomes free from all sin, fearless of death, safe from hell and endowed with the eternal righteousness, life, and salvation of its husband, Christ. Thus he presents to himself a glorious bride, truly adorned now with the grace and good works of Christ himself. And this is called a blessed exchange. Um, I'll take another Luther quote from here. By a wonderful exchange, our sins are no longer ours, but Christ's. And the righteousness of Christ is not Christ's, but ours. He has emptied himself of his righteousness, that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. 
and he has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. In the same manner as he grieved and suffered in our sins and was confounded, in the same manner we rejoice and glory in his righteousness. Now, of course, Luther doesn't mean here that Christ has like permanently become poor and, and lost his righteousness, but here is mixed, of course, the idea of, of Christ as the suffering a lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world, so that he empties himself of his divine glory and 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 takes upon himself the burden of sin and, and all human misery and, and guilt and, and bears it on the cross on, on, on behalf of his bride, the church. So is Luther's understanding of this blessed exchange to be called bridal mysticism? In some sense, yes and no. Yes, it certainly falls in the same category uh, by describing the union between Christ and the believer as a type of heavenly marriage. And still Luther, in this writing, followed his own course. There is no emphasis on mystical experience of emotion, which was so often present in Bernard of Clairvaux or other mystical writings of medieval age. Nor is there understanding of the mutual Reciprocity, reciprocity, like uh, that, you know, I, I give something and you give something, uh, uh, which would often be also present in the mystical mystics of middle medieval age, where you know Christ loves you and you love Christ back, and you have like this thing going on there. Luther states elsewhere that sinners are not loved because uh, they are beautiful, but they are beautiful because they are loved. That's what well well put by Luther. And still both sides of the statement are to be taken seriously. Salvation is through grace alone, with no merit, holiness or beauty in the believer commending her to Christ. There is nothing in the person which makes them beautiful and desirable in front of, of, in front of God. They cannot make themselves, uh, you know, you can't put makeup of good works and charm uh, God into saving you. However, once... Christ has become united with the believer. The sinner is truly beautiful in the eyes of God. So Luther, when Luther says that sinners are not saved because they are beautiful, but he adds they are beautiful because they are saved. So then um, Christ's holiness truly becomes possession of the believer because Christ himself becomes his possession. Such a soul is not only pronounced righteous, but truly is righteous because of Christ's righteousness in her. Now, it should, should be also added that uh, this kind of owning or taking hold of Christ uh, does not mean that one can observe the righteousness or holiness of Christ in, in one's own soul, obviously. Uh, we only observe it in, in Jesus outside of us. Uh, inside ourselves, Christ dwells in darkness. It is not revealed to our, to our introspection. But union with Christ, this sort of marital union with Christ, is a reality which is believed to be true. Uh, yet faith looks outside of us for strengthening of faith. Through the gospel and the sacraments, Holy Spirit uh, opens our eyes to see the grace of Christ outside of us. Now, then when we talk about sanctification or, or Christian life, sometimes there is this caricature um, of an of a idea that the justification is nothing more than heavenly record-keeping uh, trick. That, you know, somebody in heaven puts a, a little cross in a box in your form, which states now uh, that you are not guilty when previously you were called guilty. Uh, how could one then, in this case, speak 
of the good works which are meant to follow justification. Understanding salvation, though, more like a union with, with Christ, this marital union with Christ, uh, brings a new view of, of, of how good works might be possible in Christian life. The Christ that is grasped with faith and who truly becomes the believer's own is nothing less than the living true Son of God and the Lord of life. Just as well as one might say that the believer takes hold of or, or possesses Jesus through faith, one could also say that now Christ owns the believer. He is truly present in the Christian, and by his presence he brings change. The believer who receives Christ's holiness is changed by that holiness gradually. And of course, observing that change is, is hard or impossible in this life, and it's always um, incomplete in this life. But it is nonetheless true and unavoidable. Luther states, it is impossible to se separate works from faith, quite as impossible as to separate burning and shining from fire which is to say that where faith has taken place, where Christ has become the Lord of a person, uh, the husband of the soul, then good works and a new life always emerge. Since Christ is actually the source of these good works, the believer can take no pride in them. They can and often are quite hidden. Since Christ comes to dwell in the believer through the word, the regular, means of the, uh, the regular use of the means of grace becomes crucially important for any true growth in sanctification and good works. The idea that God has done his part in justification and the believer should then do his parts uh, in sanctification is, is to be avoided. But rather, uh, Christian receives Christ as also the source of all good works. Now we have, a, we have at least one hand up. Um, so Hawkon, would you like to share what you had as a question? Oh. Uh, yes, I posted in on the chat. Thank you very much. Let us read. Question regarding the legal size of marriage. If we believe the Trinity, no. Oh. Wait a second. Yes. And Christ and the church is the picture of which marriage comes from. Is there and the legal reality in addition to the exchange? For instance, is there something to the leaving the father and mother which father did on the cross, for instance? Um, Would you like to would you like to uh, continue a little bit with that question? Yeah, yeah. I I had some. Uh, I meant which the Jesus did on the cross, of course, not the uh, pater passion, passion But um, it it is since our marriage has some legal parts of it, uh, and we believe that. Uh, the Trinity and Christ Church relationship is the poor picture of our marriage. Um, what can we say about the legal? You you did you have talked a little bit about it now. The legal side, uh, legal sides of of Christ Church and the Trinity, and you talked about the, the exchange. But is there uh, some else reality, like, like I come, for instance, uh, leaving your father and mother? Uh, this might be a far-fetched one, but we know that he did leave his father on the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, uh, as a level of on on the level of, of of language, yes, it sounds very similar. You can say that the as Christ says. Like the like the leaves father and mother and joins in his wife. Indeed, that's actually a very good point you make there. That uh, 
you could say that Christ left his father in order that he would come to his bride and, and save her. And, and of course, with this kind of how it's put, it goes only so far because Jesus can't truly leave his father because his father and he are one. You know, even even his incarnation and even his death and, and, and all that, father and son completely remain as one because they, they cannot be separated from each other. But I, I think there is something there. Yeah, maybe that's a, that's a good point to take. That It is that, uh, of course, the son, when, when son leaves his father and mother, he doesn't leave them because he hates them. But he leaves them in order that he can devote himself to the, uh, to the wife. It doesn't mean that you have to start hating your uh, parents in order that you can love your uh, love your uh, wife, but rather you have to devote yourself to her and service of her. And in that sense, you could say that you know the son devotes himself to the service of of his his church with the acceptance and 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 the will of his his own father. Um, so yeah, I, I would say. I would say there is definitely something which could be applied there. We could maybe explore that a little bit more. But that's um, like with oftentimes this, if you take it too far, you kind of end up in trouble. But if you don't take it too far, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a good point. Yeah, and, and Tapani Simoyoki, you, you, made a, you made a comment there that did not Christ leave his mother at the cross. Indeed, indeed he left. And also, also before that, in, the, in his earthly life, he completely left his, well, not he didn't abandon his family, but when the, when the time came that um, his family members came to uh, take him because they thought he was insane, he he pointed out that all those who hear my word are uh, are my brothers and my sisters and my mother, and so on. So then, indeed, Christ did leave uh, leave them for the sake of his his saving work. But that's a very good question. Do we have any any other question or comment? You haven't mentioned baptism and marriage. Well, yes. Yes, we didn't go into the into the application of 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 individual uh, how this takes place. Yeah, that's a very good point. Also, thank you, Tabani. Um, Can I just chip in? Yeah, yes, please go ahead. There's all the marriages at wells throughout the Bible. Oh, at wells. Yes, yes. You actually meant wells. Yes. Do you want to share something about that, Tabani? It just is an intriguing thing throughout. You've got all the marriages at wells of of uh, Isaac and Jacob and Moses in the Old Testament, for example, and then all in the New Testament, uh, Christ and the, and the Samaritan woman and the drawing of water and the promise of the water that Christ gives as a as a as a as, a, as the source of uh, eternal salvation. And then, hey, Presto, we've got water and blood coming out of Christ and immediately after he leaves his mother. And next thing we know, we are being baptized into Christ, mm -hmm. which is a union. That's a good point. That uh, I mean, oftentimes you, when you preach about the Samaritan woman at the well, you bring up Jacob and 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 Moses and say, you know, the well is the place of of of, of love and 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 meeting your wife there. But actually, it, it might be that it's 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 well for a very specific purpose. That it's not a it's not a stable or a or a field, but it's rather the place where you draw water because. It is Christ's intention that through water and washing of the water, he presents to himself uh, a bride. As, as again, uh, Ephesians 5 talks about that it is through the washing uh, that he presents to himself this bride glorious and without any stain or wrinkle. A very, very good point. And of course, then when you go into the other sacrament, the Lord's Supper, uh, the wedding is talked always as a wedding feast. Uh, and, and wedding uh, celebration, and also that's how the Revelation 19 describes it, that, that the wedding feast of the Lamb has, has started. 
And it is oftentimes, at least around here in Finland, in our diocese, many pastors, when the when the Lord's table has been set, when they when they invite the the the, the, the congregants to come forth, they sometimes use the words, uh, "Blessed are those who are uh, invited to the." table uh, to the wedding feast of the lamb and and that is indeed the case that that the, that the lord's supper already is a foretaste of the great wedding feast that takes place in in, in heaven mm-hmm. so it, it's, it's also there as a final note i, I would maybe say that Because we see such connection between marriage and uh, and how God describes the relationship between church and and Christ or or, or His own internal being, even what the church understands and teaches about marriage is always a very heavy question. It's it's very big and important thing. And, and sometimes Christians are being criticized that we are obsessed with people's sexuality, for example, because we're always complaining about gay marriages or gay weddings or, or divorces and, 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 and all the sins that go around that. And, and oftentimes it's, it's rightly said that, you know, that, that all sins are, are bad in the eyes of God and, and you, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't always underline only one sin. Uh, the sin of adultery uh, while ignoring the others. Of course, we should n- ignore no sin. But it is also to be remembered that in, in the way God speaks of himself uh, and the way scripture reveals God's grace and God's saving work, marriage is extremely strong imagery. And it's not just a pedagogic, like a nice example God found useful in describing. But I think there is much more to it than just a very fitting example. I think there is uh, something very true and real in it, how it describes uh, these things. And therefore, if the church should, or if the society embraces uh, in the area of marriage, something which is clearly contrary to God's word, it not only, it not only commits a sin in that particular commandment, but it also breaks uh, a very mighty and, and important image God has planted uh, for describing his grace and his love. So I, I, I do not dare to say that one sin would be more serious than the other. That's not for us to say. But it is to say that the, the, that the issue of, for example, gay marriage is a very, very important thing because God has made marriage so very important, not because this is somehow... Um, uh, sexuality would be more uh, condemnable than, for example, greed or anger, but but that uh, there is such a strong message to be preached there, and and it cannot be preached if if the image of marriage is broken, and and therefore Christians must continue to fight fight for biblical understanding of of marriage among themselves, if not in the society at large. All right, I think I've probably come to the end of my, my lecture time, and of course, lots was left unsaid. But uh, as I said, said to you when we started, it doesn't matter. We can, we can sort of call it a, call it a day. And uh, I, I thank you for your attention and, and good comments and questions, and I hope we got encouragement and um, strengthening of faith from all this. Thank you very much.